All right, chapter 57, Skin Disorders. I'm going to draw you into your book again. I hope that worked well for you last time. But there's so many tables and pictures and uh, information that's in your book that you also need to read beside the text. So I'm going to help you with that. This is going to help you uh, be drawn into the book and give you a lot for, more information. So pruritus, what is pruritus? Pruritus simply is itching. It's the act of itching. It's a symptom rather than a disease and very common with skin and systemic disorders. So the sensation of itching isn't completely understood. It might be triggered by touch, temperature changes, emotional stress, chemical, mechanical, and electrical stimuli. So it's also common in dermatitis, eczema, and insect bites. In other words, other skin disorders. So I want to call your attention also to another word that's under cause and risk factors, and that's urticaria. What does urticaria mean? It's hives. It means hives. So what drugs may cause pruritus? Well, there's some cardiovascular drugs that can do it. There's opioids. So anytime someone takes maybe opioids around the clock, they might have some itching. And some meds that the patient is allergic to. So there's, their symptom may simply be itching. So notice itching as a sign and symptom of something. Maybe uh, you need to take a cool shower. And why a cool shower? Well, because it vasoconstricts, right? It decreases the blood flow to that area. So if you notice, if you ever get stressed out while you're studying or something and you start itching your skin, what happens? It turns red. Well, why does it turn red? Because of vasodilation. The blood flow to that area uh, tries to help get rid of whatever the problem is and help the body start fighting it. But coolness will vasoconstrict and pull that blood away from uh, that area and might be relieving. Also, humidity can help because what is puritis caused from dryness? So humidity in your home may help. Best thing to do is apply mild moisturizing cream. And that's something we can do without a doctor's order. Just a plain lotion. Uh, if you have a family member, bring it from home. That's always the best because I know the uh, creams at facilities aren't that great. So lotions, it's the best treatment. Also, avoid the drugs. Some systemic conditions that can cause pruritus would be renal failure because of the waste products that might be in the skin or the blood. Diabetes, the sugar can cause itching. Thyroid conditions and liver disease, the bile under your skin, that can cause itching. So when I talk about these things, please try to notice this these situations in your patients uh, since you get to go to the facilities. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, ectopic dermatitis or eczema. So the pathophysiology, uh, it's one of several disorders referred to as eczema. It has three stages. The acute stage, characterized by red oozing crusty rash and intense pruritus itching. Manifested of, uh, manifestations of the subacute stage include redness excoriations, which is like a skin breakdown, just a mild skin breakdown. Like if you fell on your knee and excoriated or just wiped a layer of skin away. And scaling plaques or pustules. Fine scales may give the patient's skin a silvery appearance in the chronic stage. The skin becomes dry, thick and scaly and brownish gray in color. Cause and risk factors, uh, family history of asthma, 
hay fever, food allergies. Notice a lot of those are allergic type conditions. So as far as medical diagnosis, you've got to get a good history so you can find out if there was a family history and do a good physical so you can look uh, at the patient and see how they look and what that skin condition looks like. It's really important that you guys learn these different types of skin conditions and then you'll know how to treat it. Uh, medical treatment, open weave and loose clothing. So to prevent that itching, we want some open weave and loose clothing that doesn't rub against those irritated areas. As far as nursing care, it's really important that you notice if there's a, an infection and that infection will be manifested by a fever. You're not gonna see anything probably you're gonna see a temperature. Now I want you to remember, if you have a fever that's systemic, that means that infection or inflammation has gone systemic. Maybe they've itched so bad that they did get an infection and that infection uh, went into uh, the bloodstream, which is systemic. And that's gonna require antibiotics, right? So monitor the patient for elevation that may reflect a systemic infection. Um, if scratching is a problem, the fingernails need to be cut short and kept smooth. So if you look at your patient teaching box, I want you to remember that avoid known irritants. I know that seems obvious. And constrictive clothing. So loose clothing. Use moisturizers and sunscreens. Under altered self-concept, well, you know, teach the patient and family that dermatitis is not contagious and is not caused by poor hygiene. Not caused by poor hygiene. I repeated it. Yeah, I did. Explore the patient's concerns about their skin disorder. And if the patient is stressed, you might need to do some coping disorders, meditation, guided imagery, relaxation type exercises. We can also use some soaks to keep the area moist that's dry. Occlusive dressing so the patients can't get uh, to the areas and itch them. I know we've had patients where we've had to wrap their arms because they had such intense itching and it could have been stress it may not have been anything else and remember keep those nails short so they don't get an infection okay let's go to contact dermatitis what is contact dermatitis it's an inflammatory condition caused by contact with a substance that triggers an allergic response. Now in chapter five, uh, we did talk about some of those things. I'm gonna turn to chapter five right now and show you and tell you the page number. So it talks a lot about um, immunity, inflammation and infection. So, I know I should have had it ready for you. Apologize for that. So on page 77, table 5.4, it talks about common allergies and their triggers, like asthma, conjunctivitis, anaphylaxis, which could is a bad thing, we've learned, right? Hives or urticaria, another great word to add to your vocabulary, can be foods, drugs. Atopic dermatitis or eczema could be soaps, cosmetics, chemicals, fabrics, even poison ivy. 
is a contact dermatitis. You can probably picture that a little easier, huh? Also, some people have a contact dermatitis to latex. So latex gloves, latex balloons. Okay. Seborrheic dermatitis. So seborrheic dermatitis, the pathophysiology, is a chronic inflammatory disease of the skin. It usually affects the scalp, eyebrows, eyelids, lips, ears, sternal area, axilla. I can go on, but it's in your book. But look at this. Seborrheic dermatitis of the scalp is called dandruff. Now that's a visual. And you've got some good pictures here on your slides. Um, dandruff is a good example, but sometimes behind the ears, people get the seborrheic dermatitis, the back of the neck, um, on the forehead, you might see some redness. For dandruff, you would use like the Selsun Blue type of uh, shampoo on the skin, you can use like a Nizerol type of uh, medication. Nizerol. Also, some topical corticosteroids are good. All right, you can see on the next page. Wow, 1116 shows some more. Uh, shows some psoriasis there which is what we're gonna talk about next. So psoriasis is an autoimmune disorder. Remember what autoimmune means? It means you're allergic to yourself. Auto, yourself. Automatic, yourself. Immune, you're having immune reaction to yourself. Something in your body is reacting. Uh, it's characterized by abnormal proliferation or overgrowth of skin cells. Although the onset is common in young adulthood, it can appear at any age. Uh, psoriasis may affect a limited body area or may be extensive. Some people have systemic effects of the disease such as psoriatic arthritis. So that's pretty important to know. So if you take yourself to the um, medical treatment it talks about moderate to severe psoriasis may be treated with sorelin and ultraviolet A or PUVA light, a combination of methotrexate and UVA. But also look at the pharmacological capsule. If a woman of childbearing age is taking methotrexate or oral retinoids, ensure that she understands that these drugs are harmful to the fetus. If the patient suspects she's pregnant, she should inform her physician immediately if taking either of these drugs. So remember, pharmacology, really important. If you don't know what a medication is and you're getting ready to give it to your patient, you should look it up because you need to know these kind of things. You need to know what symptoms the patient can have. The other pharmacological capsule here is because of the risks to the fetus, women should use reliable contraception. Okay. So always inspect the affected areas for lesions. Now, when I talk about um, document joint pain, and that's in your book under focused assessment, document joint pain or stiffness because the condition may cause arthritis, and that's called psoriatic arthritis. Now, there is medication for that. You've probably seen it on TV, but you need to be very careful uh, and notice these things. Notice you're at the bedside. Very important to let the doctor know. So let's look at the nursing care plan in your book on page 1117. And it talks about a patient with a sorry eyes. Sorry. Sorry, I, no, I suddenly can't say it. 
That's so funny. Psoriasis. There we go. That's funny. So look at, in the nursing care plan, altered self-concept related to lesions and scales on the skin. What do you do about that? What do you as a nurse do for an altered concept of their body? You can't change their body. You can try to help them. But let's look at the intervention. Really important to know this. So demonstrate acceptance. No matter how they look or how they feel when you touch them. Demonstrate acceptance of the patient through eye contact and touch. You can have gloves on because everybody's supposed to wear gloves anyway, right? So you can even say that. You know I'm wearing gloves for your protection. You don't have to say I'm protecting myself from you. You can say I want to protect you. Be aware of personal reaction to lesions. Encourage the patient to share feelings about their condition. Help the patient to feel in control by providing information, knowledge is power, about the management of psoriasis. Okay. Let's go to intertrigo. So you probably know what this is. You just never knew the name. It's where skin folds meet. There usually gets, it looks like a, a rash or a redness where skin folds meet. It could be, shows you some pictures here under the neck, elbow, sometimes it's thighs, right? Uh, people walking, getting their redness of the thighs touching. I've heard of that. Skin folds. Patients have skin folds. They get the intertrigo in where the two surfaces meet. So heat and friction, two surfaces touching, those are the causes. And what happens if you don't take care of this? Well, you can get candida, right? So warm, moist places like folds, what likes to grow there? Candida albicans. So you always need to clean those folds really well. Do not put cornstarch. It's contraindicated. And it talks about that in your book. Um, also, what I'd like to say here is that um, Remember, heat, friction, skin folds. Very important to remember. And it talks about another treatment, potassium hydroxide, KOH. Well, let's figure out what does KOH mean. K stands for potassium. If it stands by itself, it means potassium, right? OH is hydroxide, hydrogen and oxygen, hydroxide. So that's potassium hydroxide. That's what KOH is. So I don't want it to seem like some unusual weird thing because we can figure it out. So sometimes though, if you do have uh, something growing, you might need clotrimazole. You can do wet soaks with tap water or Burroughs solution. Those are usually on the uh, cart. Uh, the the uh, treatment cart could be an order, Burrow solution, and that can be ordered to remove exudite, especially if there's infection present. Intertrigo is fairly common among patients in long-term care facilities. So I know that there have been skin folds. I'll tell you some funny stories. Skin folds, I had one patient she had so many skin folds, we lifted one up and there was a hamburger in there. I'm not lying, it's true. All right, so keep skin folds dry, cornstarch contraindicated. Remember that it's skin folds, very important. 
and those are heat, friction, and moisture, two touching body parts. Let's go to fungal infections. I'm taking you to your book, I'm on 1118, about, oh, three quarters of the way down on that page. Fungal infections. Pathophysiology, um, pathophysiology, it's superficial infections of the skin and mucous membranes. Now there's many type of fungi, fungal infections. There's tinea pedis, which is athlete's foot, tinea mandis, which would be a fungal infection on the hand, tinea cruris, which is in the groin, tinea capitis, which is on the scalp, tinea corporis, the body, tinea barbae, in the beard, and candidiasis, which can affect the skin, mouth, vagina, GI tract, and lungs. So, the organism that causes tinea infections take advantage of trauma in moist, warm tissue. So notice that keeps coming up, doesn't it? Warm, moist areas. So the lay term ringworm is sometimes used to describe these circular lesions. Because they're circular, they look like a ring. And back in the old days, they, maybe they thought it was up from a worm. They knew something was happening and it was in a ring like a worm. So kind of, some of these old names stick. Um, and pruritus is a common symptom of tinea. Scratching that breaks the skin can lead to a secondary bacterial infection. That's why we always keep nails short. Uh, sometimes we've even had to wrap areas to prevent the patient from getting to them. Now, candidiasis, commonly called yeast infection, is caused by C. albicans. Again, we'll talk about uh, diabetes or risk for this. Common sites that are affected by these fungal infections could be the mouth, vagina, and skin. The skin around an ostomy, uh, that gets moist in that area, whether it's a a colostomy or a ureterostomy, there is moisture that grows around an ostomy site. Now, look at the pharmacology capsule. Antibiotic therapy eliminates the microorganisms that normally control fungal growth, making the patient susceptible to fungal infections. So this is where I'm gonna throw this word in iatrogenic again. So sometimes antibiotic therapy, we're giving for something, and then it causes the overgrowth of fungus. So that is an iatrogenic. It's caused from something other treatment that the patient is getting. So medical diagnosis, um, they do scrapings from a lesion using a co- wet mount preparation, the potassium hydroxide, medical treatment, uh, carolytics, oral candidiasis is treated with chlorotrimazole troches. What's a troche? Well, a troche is like a lozenge. So it's important for you to know that because you may be giving those nystatin mouthwash, the swish and swallow kind of or it may be swish and spit, so be sure you notice what the orders are on a mouthwash. Um, for acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS patients, chlorotrimazole superior to nystatin. Systemic fungal infections, very hard to cure. They require intravenous amphotericin B. Amphotericin is a very rough IV drug very hard on the body. It's very toxic. And when I used to give uh, amphotericin, and that is a, a drug that I used to give, um, we'd have to pre-medicate the patient with Benadryl and Tylenol because they're at risk for chills, fever, headache. So we would pre-medicate them. 
Now that leads us down here to the pharmacological capsule. Systemic amphotericin B is highly toxic to the kidneys. An infusion of one liter of saline on the day of treatment helps to reduce the renal damage. All right, so um, the focused assessment, the nursing assessment identifies conditions that might make a person susceptible to fungal infections, including diabetes, malnutrition, and immunosuppression. All right, so again, just always going to be, you know, it looks kind of gross, fungal infections do. Um, wear your gloves, be sensitive, reposition the patient so that uh, they can stay off of these uh, areas. And wet compresses. Let's go to acne. That's something I bet everybody can relate to, right? Acne is a skin condition that affects the hair follicles and sebaceous glands. Chief characteristics are comedones, which are whiteheads and blackheads, pustules, and cysts. Uh, sometimes it just occurs during adolescence, and it, but it can last a lifetime. Begins in adolescence because of the hormones. Uh, so acne lesions develop when androgenic hormones cause increased sebum, it's oil, production, and bacteria. Now, it's important for you to know this because, well, it's not important for the test, but it's important for you to just know this in general, that um, it is not caused by fatty foods, chocolate, or poor hygiene. Let's go down to the pharmacological capsule. Accutane can cause mental depression, and Accutane is the treatment for acne. So Accutane can cause mental depression, possibly leading to suicide ideation. Should depression develop, contact the physician immediately to have the drug discontinued. Depression should resolve once the drug is stopped. So that's one pharmacological capsule I want to draw your attention to, but the really important one too, I want you to know, really important, is that Accutane can cause severe fetal deformities. So anytime, especially an adolescent who's at a sexual heightened time, um, Accutane can cause severe fetal deformities. So if they are put on Accutane, they need to be on birth control maybe even a double birth control because you do not want a birth defect from Accutane. So I'm just going to read this pharmacological capsule again because it's pretty important. Accutane can cause severe fetal deformities. Therefore, women who, who take the drug must prevent pregnancy until at least one month after therapy has been completed. So that's pretty important. Then if you go down under nursing care of the patient with acne, and I'm going to go to inability to manage treatment program. Well, it's important that we tell our patients, don't pick, don't pick at yourself. Don't pick at those, those pimples, don't, that acne, don't pick, don't pick. Discourage picking or squeezing lesions because it may force infected material deeper into the follicle. Advise the patient that harsh cleansers and vigorous scrubbing have no therapeutic value. Uh, prescribed drugs can discuss any adverse effects. Patient teaching is important because of the uh, Accutane. And there's a whole lecture. They even have to, when a doctor gives Accutane, he should do a pregnancy test first. And he even has the patient do an eye pledge program to receive the drug, where they get detailed information about the drug because of those fetal deformities. And remember, this happens with teenagers, so they're at the prime 
sexual uh, activity. This one we're going to probably relate more to personal than to patients, but you never know. What if you work in a dermatology office? Okay, let's go to herpes simplex. So herpes simplex, or HSV, herpes simplex virus, causes an infection that begins with itching and burning and progresses to development of vesicles that rupture and form crusts. Sites most often infected are nose, lips, cheeks, ears, and genitalia. Oral, now this is kind of important uh, for you guys to remember because it's important just to know. I should say the difference between it's important to know and it's really important to know, okay? Let's just kind of go with that. So oral HSV lesions are commonly called cold sores or fever blisters. So there is an HSV-1, and those are infections on the face and upper body. But genital infections are usually caused by HSV, which is herpes simplex virus 2. So there's a 1 and a 2. 1 is like on the lip, like in your pic this picture here. And then 2 would be in the genitals, and that would be considered an STI. Uh, now, what's important to know about this particular herpes is that there's periods of outbreaks and remissions. Outbreaks and remissions. So don't ever think that it just totally goes away because it doesn't. So outbreaks and remissions. And that HSV can be transmitted by direct contact. That's important to remember as well. Now, what's the treatment? Well, a cyclovir, Zovirax for cold sores, or Abriva, that's sold over the counter. Uh, sexual contact should be documented so that those persons can be advised of the need for medical evaluation. And that's the herpes simplex too. Now, if you do have that, or if you know someone that has that, they need to tell the partner. You should never have sexual contact without notifying the person of something that you have because it is an STI. It can be very painful, both places on the lip, it's painful. You, you can even feel it coming sometimes. You feel like a little tingling feeling. Um, so some interventions for pain would be analgesics and topical anesthetics. I know that uh, with the cold sores, my daughter used to get a lot of cold sores in her lip and her pediatrician recommended Benadryl and Mylanta just to kind of put on the areas because it was more like an allergic reaction. I, I think she, uh, maybe stress would bring that out. Um, and that would help the discomfort and it would calm it down and not make it so painful. You can also do compresses saturated with astringent uh, solutions such as burrow solution. Okay, so what do we get out of that anyway? Well, we got out that it, it has outbreaks and remissions. So that's pretty important to remember. And then herpes simplex can be transmitted by direct contact. And genital lesions, which is the herpes simplex 2, uh, is commonly spread by sexual contact. And you should notify your, I was going to say notify your neighbor, but I mean notify your partner. Okay, let's move on to some herpes zoster. So herpes zoster, you probably already know. It's related to the chickenpox virus. So in some people who have had chickenpox, the virus remains latent or it just dormant. It's alive but inactive in nerve tissue until the infection is activated in the form of shingles. So herpes zoster is shingles. 
It's also the chickenpox organisms. But the interesting thing is that it follows a nerve path. So when you notice this look or these pustules, they follow from the spine around the side. Now it can be as high as the head. I had one that went into the eye. I had a patient who had it, the nerve root went to the eye. It can cause blindness, so that's a bad situation. But usually it goes around the trunk of the body and you can just see it following that nerve root, go right around in the little pustules uh, or vesicles. So the lesions typically last about two weeks. Uh, possible complications, what, what do you think those would be? So maybe some infection, right? It's also contagious when they rupture, so they might have to be in isolation. Herpes zoster infection is treated with antivirals. Now there is a shot, a shingle shot, that patients can get with their over 60. They may receive a vaccine for herpes zoster. Anybody under 60 who has herpes zoster can also be given the vaccine. All right. Um, any other questions? Okay. That to that. Tizanic test, that's just a scraping of the vesicles. Now you can get a post-herpetic neuralgia, they call it, uh, which is nerve pain. And it's treated with uh, analgesics, anticonvulsants, and antidepressants. Other methods, um, nerve blocks, acupuncture, I mean, if it's really bad. Okay, let's move to necrotizing fasciitis. Now I have to make a confession. So when I was a nurse in the ICU, this was one of my favorite things to take care of. I don't know why. Just because it was challenging, I think. So it's an infection. Please don't think poorly of me now. You know, but as a nurse, you, you like to be challenged. Infection of deep fascial structures under the skin. It can be aerobic and anaerobic organisms. Now, what does that mean? Well, aerobic means they need air. Anaerobic means they do not need oxygen. Anaerobic may be something inside where there's no opening to the outside. Something's growing inside. Uh, the, the organisms would be streptococcus, staphylococcus, peptostreptococcus, Bacteroids and Clostridium species. Uh, necrotizing fasciitis should be suspected when a patient has a small external wound with evidence of larger underlying inflammation. Treatment involves extensive debridement, IV and topical antibiotics, and possibly eventual grafting. Because necrotizing, what does that mean? That's another good word. It means it's dead tissue, right? Dying tissue. And this is of the fascia. All right. Patients and family need to be aware of the severity of the disease process. And everybody on the healthcare team needs to provide emotional, spiritual, and psychological support. So if there was grafting to be done, they would take away all that dead tissue, right? So that um, they can get new tissue growing. And this necrotizing fasciitis means that there's blood flow. Some part of the skin is deprived of blood flow. So tissue necrosis occurs. So some other infections uh, that they talk about is on page 1124. And this is just informational, table 57.1, additional skin infections, impetigo folliculitis, varuncles, which is a boil, carbuncle, escipelas, 
cellulitis, we probably see a lot at that in facilities, usually streptococcus pyrogens. So might need an antibiotic for that. And then there is infestations. Look at that. Lice. Oops, I skipped it. Darn it. Okay, well, there's a picture. Anyway, um, it's lice and scabies are two infestations, infestations of the skin. And those would need to be, need to be treated. Okay, we're going to be talking about uh, pemphigus now. So it's a chronic autoimmune condition where they develop blisters develop on the face, back, chest, groin, and umbilicus. Blisters rupture easily, releasing a foul-smelling drainage. So that is the definition of pemphigus. It's a foul-smelling uh, odor from a boule or blister. Uh, potassium permanganate baths Oatmeal products need to reduce the odor, decrease the risk of infection, because when they break open, they could get infected. Treatment would be corticosteroids, other immunosuppressants, and topical or oral antibiotics. And patients with extensive skin loss require the same care as burn patients. So now cancer. Skin cancers are classified as non-melanoma or melanoma. Non-melanoma skin cancers include basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell. Risk factors for cancers are sun exposure, fair skin and freckling, light colored hair and skin, male gender cigarette smoking, Tanning beds. That's why spray tan's better if you want to get a tan. Do that. They also have some nice lotions that help give you a tan. Uh, but tanning beds were labeled uh, carcinogenic to humans after years of controversy and study. And the risk of non-melanoma skin cancers increased with the total amount of sun exposure. Now, when I was a kid, they didn't really have suntan lotion. So I used um, baby oil, which wasn't a good thing to do. Now I know. So now I use a lot of sunscreen. Now, actinic keratosis is another thing. The non-melanoma skin cancer, which can divide it into the basal cell and the squamous cell carcinoma. The melanoma. Now, what's important here about melanoma? If you'll follow with me on page 1126 now. Melanoma arises from the pigment producing skin's uh, cells in the skin, the melanin. Most serious from most serious form of skin cancers because it can be fatal if it metastasizes. So important to remember is that melanomas can be found anywhere on the body, not just sun exposed areas. The cutaneous T cell lymphoma is characterized by the migration of malignant T cells to the skin. It does not require sun either. Kaposi sarcoma. Now, I'm pretty familiar with Kaposi sarcoma because when I worked in the AIDS unit down in Los Angeles, uh, that's how our patient, patients presented. We didn't know about AIDS at that time. We only know that gay males were presenting with this skin lesion on their legs. It was red. Um, and then 
that will spread to the organs, but it starts as a skin lesion. Important to know about that. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we get to um, AIDS. Uh, no, it's a malignancy of the blood vessels. It's manifested by red, blue, or purple macules, common, accompanied by pain, itching, and swelling. And it's seen in patients with HIV. Unfortunately, treatment results have been discouraging. And that's because it hits the immunosuppressed who are already not well. So the outcome usually is not good. So let's go to disorders of the nails. Not a whole lot to say here, uh, except to uh, show patients in peripheral vascular disease or diabetes how to inspect their feet and advise them to seek medical attention for any abnormality. Send them to a podiatrist if you have to, but don't cut their nails. Because if you do, you can cause, you might nick the skin and cause an infection. And we know in diabetics, an infection can be very bad because of the increased amount of sugar in the blood. Um, it just proliferates, grows an infection, it feeds bacteria. Uh, also, the other problem with um, diabetics is that they have poor circulation. So they can't feel if they have a problem. They may not feel that ingrown toenail, or they may not feel that something that they stepped on or a wound on the bottom of their foot. They can't see it, and they can't feel it, so they don't know it's there. And it can get bad before they even realize it. So it's up to you as a nurse uh, to look your patient over and be sure that uh, there's no problems. Okay. Remember one time I had a patient come in. Uh, he was a liver patient. He came in to the office for daily weights. And uh, I weighed him. And I said, so how are you feeling? And he's like, I'm okay, except my foot's bothering me. And I said, well, what? He goes, I don't know what it is. I can't see it. So what did I do? I looked at his foot and he had a big ulcer on the bottom of his foot. He did not know. He just knew something didn't feel right. So this was in a GI office and that's not the place to find a foot infection. So I sent him to his primary doctor so that they could take care and treat his infection. So not only was he, now, see he was a liver patient and he couldn't feel, he couldn't see, because it can damage the nerves. Okay, so this is really important here, burns. I'm going to talk a little here about burns. Burns are tissue injuries caused by heat. Depending on the source of injury, the burn is described as thermal, which is flame, flesh, or scalding liquids chemical, electrical, radiation, or inhalation. Burns are a leading cause of accidental death despite improved survival rates. I had an electrician once who had a burn injury, a different type of burn injury, this is the electrical injury, where he was testing an outlet and the burn from the electricity went in one hand up the arm through his heart out the other hand and he got a heart attack from it. Isn't that interesting? But that was the electricity burning through his body. All right, so um, that can be the pathophysiology. The classification is describing the depth. A burn is classified as partial thickness or full thickness, depending on the layers of tissue injured. Now let's go to burn size. This is where it gets really important to know. There's a couple things here that are important to know. So the rule of nines, and there's a picture in your book on page 1127 that you must know. The rule of nines. So here's what you need to know about that. So the body is divided into nines. 
So the front of the leg is a nine, the back of the leg is a nine. The front of each arm, one arm is 4.5, the other arm is 4.5, and the back is 4.5. The front of the body is 18%, the back of the body is 18%. The head is considered 4.5%. So you might be given a question that says, patient comes in, he's burned in the groin and the legs. What percent of the body is burned? So you would add up, if it's the front and back of the legs, it's 80% each leg, which would be 36, plus the groin is one, which is 37. I don't know what the answer, because I just know that you've got to do a little addition here without your phone, but you can do that. Just add them up. Just remember that you have to know those, okay? The rule of nines in burns. That's on page 1127. That's so hard once you uh, get to remember it. All right, so the pathophysiology of burns. So this is important if you're going to take care of burn patients. It increases capillary permeability. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means the capillary permeability, it's not stable. So it's leaky, it leaks. So it leaks fluid out of the capillaries into the tissues. So they lose fluid that way. And it permits plasma to leak into the tissues. which injury to cell membranes permits excess sodium to enter the cell and allows potassium to escape from the extracellular compartment. These shifts in fluids and electrolytes cause local edema. So you know swelling in a burn and a decrease in cardiac output. Why that? Well, because the fluids are all going to the wrong places. They're not staying in the vascular compartment to support the heart. So the cardiac output has less to put out because the volume is less in the vascular spaces. It's in the extravascular spaces. So 18 to 36 hours after a burnt injury, injury, capillary permeability begins to normalize and reabsorption of edema begins. Now let's look at the systemic effects because these are pretty important too. Fluid balance. So I just told you that there was capillary permeability, there was a leakage of the fluids, the cardiac output is less. So a shift of plasma proteins from the capillaries may result in hypoproteinemia. So already they have low protein. It causes a fluid to shift. So fluid resuscitation is critical during the first 24 to 48 hours. It's very critical during that time. That's why there's burn units, so that they can keep track of that I and O. So in the next, under I'm under fluid balance systemic effects on page 1129. It says, as the capillaries recover and edema fluid is reabsorbed, the patient's blood volume increases. If kidney function is adequate, urine output increases to prevent hypervolemia. So what are we saying here? Well, we're because this is pretty important to understand. So first of all, you're suffering. The patient is going to suffer from intravascular fluid and it's going to go to the extravascular space. So they're not going to have as much volume in their uh, bloodstream, right? And then, so we've got to support them cardiovascularly. Then after that initial 24 to 36 hours, 18, 36 hours, um, it's going to change. And then the shift of proteins from the capillaries results, uh, it causes a fluid shift into the bloodstream. And then they become hypervolemic almost, especially if you've poured a lot of fluids into them. 
So their kidneys have to be working to handle that volume. So as the capillaries recover and edema fluid is reabsorbed, now I'm under systemic effects, fluid balance. If kidney functions is adequate, urine output increases to prevent hypervolemia. So right there, INO, very important. You gotta keep track of the fluids you're giving them. You gotta keep track of their urine output, right? And it's gonna, initially you're gonna give a lot of volume in, and then it's gonna begin to equilibrate and the kidneys are gonna, if they're working right, are gonna start putting out that volume. You're putting volume in to keep them up cardiovascular wise. And then if their kidneys are working, they're gonna pour the urine out. So INO, really important. All right, so GI wise, fluid uh, blood flow to the intestines decreases and an ileus can develop. So again, it has to do with the fluid shifts. The fluid has shifted out of the vascular space. And of course the major organs, except for the heart and brain, suffer from lack of oxygen and lack of blood flow. So they may develop an, an ileus. So you're gonna to listen to their bowel sounds. Now their immune system, let me go back to their GI system for a second. It talks about ulcers developing in their stomach after severe burns. Therefore, they're routinely treated with antacids to neutralize gastric acid and H2 receptor blockers to reduce gastric acid secretion. A lot of patients that are very, very ill get acid suppression medication because of the stress. So under the immune system, because immunity is depressed after a serious burn, the patient is less able to resist infection. This is why they're usually in isolation. They're in special burn units where everything is done sterilely. The nurses wear gowns and gloves and masks, right? The loss of the protective skin barrier from the burn puts the patient at risk for life-threatening infections. So burn patients are monitored closely for signs of infection. MRSA, VRE, the most common organisms that may be seen in burn patients that come from overseas is a cynicobacter. So military that come back with burns from explosives, sometimes come back with a different type of infection. Now let's look under respiratory system. Now, wait, wait, stop page 1129. Let's stay on that for one second. So under burn severity, if you'll bear with me, um, there's the three pictures of the burn depth, showing you the burn depth of patients. And it talks about burn severity. I'm sorry I missed this one when I was talking. I, I get carried away sometimes, okay? Sorry. Um, so we talked about the rule of nines. And this says burn size 25% or more body surface area for people younger than 40, 20 or more body surface area for people older than 40 years of age. That's severity of burns. They can be disfiguring, disabling, high voltage electrical burn injuries uh, is a problem, can be a problem. Now this is something you need to know about, inhalation burns. So it's not visual, right? Now, people who are in a fire, maybe they avoid getting burnt. You know, usually you go down to the ground if you're in a fire because that's where the oxygen is. Um, but you can still breathe in that hot fire. If you do, you can have inhalation burns. Now, one of the signs as a nurse that you can know if they had an inhalation burn is it says anytime you see black suit around the mouth and nose, an inhalation injury should be suspected. Now we call that sooty sputum. 
that's hard to say, sooty, because of the suit, the blackness, S-O-O-T-Y, sooty, sputum. So they cough up black or there's black around their mouth or in their mouth secretions. Sooty sputum. So that means they've inhaled, they've had an inhalation injury. So important to remember that. We remember under systemic fluids, just doing a little recap here, um, that the fluid balance, how critical that is, and how important it is to know if the kidney function is adequate, the urine output increases because of the um, hypervolemia, all the fluids that you had to pour into the patient initially. All right. So remember, well, I went back to talk about that burn severity, but under respiratory, it also talks about sooty sputum, sputum on page 1130. It talks about suspect inhalation injury. This is right at the top of the page. Suspect inhalation injury if the patient has facial burns, redness and swelling in the pharynx, redness, restlessness, cough, dyspnea, or sooty sputum. You need to know that that's really important. Now, carbon monoxide displaces, displaces oxygen or O2 on hemoglobin, so blood is unable to transport oxygen to the tissue. This is a different type of a, a injury, carbon monoxide burning. Uh, the patient will show signs of hypoxia and die if the condition is not corrected. We'll talk more about that. Uh, Smoke poisoning is the result of inhaling combustion byproducts. Thermal injury to the lower airway is rare, but can happen if the patient was unconscious or inhaled live steam. So let's stay on page 1130 and go down to the obvious psychological effects that a burn can have. Um, it varies from person to person. Some people can deal better than others. I see it on uh, news ads all the time about patients coming back with burn injuries. Uh, some of our soldiers that had burn injuries. <clears throat> so a psychologist, psychiatric nurse practitioner, or psychiatric clinical nurse specialist should be involved with the care of the patient and the family from the beginning. There's four stages of psychologic response, impact, where it occurs, retreat or withdrawal, acknowledgement, and then reconstruction where they can really start to heal. So under medical treatment in the emergent stage, I wanna to move to that, and I'm still on page 1130. In the emergency department, the staff first assesses airway, breathing, and circulation, A, B, C. So they'll assess the airway, uh, they'll start IV lines, they'll put a Foley catheter in, again, we're measuring I and O, we gotta be there to keep it balanced. Baseline labs, a tetanus prophylactically, a wound is cleaned and debrided, and this can be pretty painful. And so uh, it's, it's a, just a battle for the first 24 hours of keeping this patient stable. Weight is another way of telling fluid balance. And so for the first 24 hours, um, IV fluids may consist of various combinations of electrolytes, colloids, which means it's more blood-like, it's thick. Um, and dextrose solutions. For the second 24 hours, volume is usually decreased based on urine output. So again, that, those kidneys want to be sure those are working. So let's go to page 1131. I know there's a lot of interesting information here. Uh, wound care uh, will be sylvadine. You've probably seen that or heard of that to be put on burns, silvadine. And of course, a tetanus shot is important. 
uh, might have to have debridements and grafting on wounds. And here we it brings us to the word debridement. So what is debridement? It's a partial thickness burn that may blister, peel, and heal with minimal long-term effects. Now, what you need to know in this paragraph here under debridement is it talks about an eschar, E-C-S-H-A-R. So what is an eschar? Well, it's dead skin, right? It's dead tissue. So under debridement, it says, if eschar encircles a limb, in other words, it goes all the way around an arm or a leg. Now this is dead tissue and it tightens up. And maybe the, the arm is getting fluid, so it might be getting larger. It might be getting edema at this point, right? So if eschar encircles a limb, it may need to be incised or cut to permit tissue swelling without compromising circulation. So you can imagine, let's just take an arm. So you have a blackened area around an arm, like an armband, and it's tight because it's dead. It's not going anywhere. But the body has more fluid and it may be swelling up. Well, if that eschar stays tight around the arm, it's like leaving your blood pressure cuff pumped up to 200. It's going to lead to a problem. So that, that dead tissue might need to be cut so that the patient doesn't suffer any loss of mobility. Uh, debridement may be accomplished by mechanical means uh, with scissors and forceps. It's usually a physician that does that, by the way. Enzymatic debridement is the use of topical medications containing enzymes capable of dissolving necrotic tissue. And then we'll go to skin grafting. And that's basically, um, we take a graft of skin, it might be from the thigh or the buttocks, a good piece of tissue from one part of the body and graft it to another part of the body. Now this is really good because the body's not gonna fight that off, it's its own body. But they do now, have a lot of newer ways. They have graphs that um, are artificial graphs. They have like meshes that are um, more, they use a lot. Because of all the injuries in the military, we've learned a lot about uh, burn injuries. So a mesh graft has multiple tiny slits that allow the skin to stretch to cover a large area. Uh, graphs vary in size. All right, you can read through this um, skin grafting. It's pretty interesting, actually. Sad, I don't know. It really takes a special nurse in a special area to take care of a burn patient. So scarring is definitely a possibility after a burn, especially if it's a deep burn. Uh, so they might need to wear a custom fit garment that apply continuous pressure. I do believe there's a picture, oh, maybe not. I thought that was a picture on 1128, but it's not. So it's, it's kind of like a mesh suit. Oh, there it is. It's on page 1132. I thought there was one. It's a suit that kind of holds um, everything in place. They're worn 23 hours a day and may be prescribed for as long as two years. And these need to be tight to be effective. So sometimes it's uncomfortable. Burns is not a good thing in general. Uh, nursing care of the patient with a burn injury. Again, uh, you gotta keep on top of their INO, physical exam, uh, watch their vital signs, their blood pressure, their breathing, their pulse. One thing you guys are gonna learn um, under physical exam, it talks about hypoxia. So if you'll find that part, hypoxia under physical exam. Now, classically, across the line, 
every disease we talk about, any problems that we discuss can be, these symptoms are always going to be the same for hypoxia. Restlessness, tachypnea. So they start breathing quickly and they become breathless or restless, excuse me. Deficient fluid volume or hypovolemia. They're going to be tachycardic, hypotensive. Infection, they'll have fever and tachycardia. So you always want to keep track of all of these things. And if you follow a graph, you can see any changes that occur. So always remember as far as interventions, uh, adequate circulation, watch their vital signs cardiovascular wise, uh, adequate tissue perfusion, cool, pale, cyanotic, restlessness, confusion. You want to keep an eye on all of that. Strict INO. Be sure they have an IV intact. Uh, increased fluid volume may result from retention of fluid in the compartments. Monitor the patient vital signs for hypertension, dyspnea, and full bounding pulse. Another sign of hypervolemia. Urine output. Pain, it hurts like heck. The burn patient is given opioid analgesics like morphine, might, maybe fentanyl, but definitely pain needs to be under control. They might even have to be sedated for a while. Potential for infection, yeah, at risk for, because they, they've lost the, their protection. Their integumentary system is not intact any longer, which is their main barrier to infection. So always watch for fever, increased white count, any systemic signs of infection. Um, loss of heat through the burn work. Now I'm under decreased temperature. So loss of heat through the burn wound surface places the patient at risk for hypothermia. So monitor their temperature. And in an older patient, that's uh, rough because they can't maintain a body temperature that well anyway. So monitor their temperature. And as they, they begin to heal under inadequate nutrition, uh, they need adequate nutrition because their metabolic demands are gonna be great on the body to heal. So they need nutrition meals if they can eat they might need tpn if they're unable to eat that's uh, peripheral nutrition temporary peripheral nutrition impaired mobility they might not be able to move so well so they might need physical therapy involved uh, this is important and i know we've talked about this before in immobility so keep injured limbs in functional position as much as possible. Okay, you can read through some of this other parts. Um, very interesting, very intense. Plastic surgery might have to be uh, something that they do. Let me turn one more. I think I've got one more slide left. So there's different types of plastic surgery. There could be a reconstructive type of surgery, such as after a, a burn patient. Aesthetic surgery, just if you want like a face lift or a tummy tuck, something like that. Uh, Pre-op nursing care, they would be in a short stay unit usually for that. I have seen somebody that had a tummy tuck and man oh man. She had bulb syringes and she was wrapped tight with uh, some gauze. So it does depend. She had to wear a girdle type of situation. So it does depend on what kind of plastic surgery they have. Uh, 
Um, they are, you do need to do a good focused assessment intervention because they are going to have pain. Minor procedures such as a blepharoplasty or an eye lift usually cause minimal pain, but major procedures such as a grafting or abdominal plasty, tummy tuck, uh, can be very painful. They're at risk for infection because again, you're breaking the skin. Potential for injury. So you wanna be sure they get oxygen to uh, all the tissues and remove waste products. I'm on page 1137 now, by the way. Um, just monitor the vital signs and the, con the patient's condition, the wounds, the dressings. All right, and always have a good attitude. Assure your patient that they're in good hands. That will decrease their anxiety. And you know, when you decrease their anxiety, they can heal better because an immune system can react to stress. So if stress is reduced, their immune system can react better. All right, thanks, sorry I kept you so long. Thank you.